I've never taught my students anything. I just try to put them in the best conditions to learn. Albert Einstein. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the third webinar series, Diapad Lab Talks, first semester, 2022. Diapad Lab Talks offers educational webinars dedicated to lab scientists, anatomic pathology professionals, anatomopathologists, and students. Diapad is an Italian-based company successfully providing high-quality solutions to pathologists, lab scientists and lab professionals all around the world. Today, Diapad is a fast-growing company with a worldwide presence, counting on a network of dealerships in more than 90 countries, providing both commercial and service solutions. We offer a complete portfolio of solutions for the Anatomic Pathology Lab, including 868 products. We are eager to get in touch with you. Register to our live virtual demo, search and choose any Diapad instrument from your lab and book a live demo with our specialists. Not only products and solutions, we are there to empower pathologists and lab professionals, sharing the best ideas. Join diapadlabtalks.com, the connecting hub with a complete range of scientific articles, webinars, training resources, a state-of-the-art blog, and podcasts, hosting interviews with opinion leaders and experts. Diapad is approved CEU's provider by NSH, National Society for Histotechnology. Please follow the instructions under the website www.diapadlabtalks.com. Diapad Lab Talks include four webinars, starting from the first one up to June 2022. Register now under www.diapadlabtalks.com and the webinars. Before starting the webinar, just some practical information. The webinar is about 30 minutes. Then we're going to have a question and answer session at the very end of the webinar. So you're kindly invited to have your questions at the very end, typing the questions in the chat for the final open discussion. Thank you. Welcome to this presentation. My name is Veronica Benjo and I am an histopathologist from Cordoba, Argentina. I want to thank Diapat for this opportunity given to me to share with you a challenging case from our daily practice, together with an overview of the spindle cell lesions of the adult prostate. The case is that of an 81-year-old man who presented with lower urinary symptoms, abnormal digital rectal examination and high PSA level. The preoperative diagnosis based on ultrasound images, was that of a very voluminous prostatic hyperplasia. For this reason, an open adenomectomy was performed in place of a simple transurethral resection, which is usually done in case of symptomatic prostatic hyperplasia. At the microscopic examination, we can see it here, the resected specimen was a very voluminous mass, composed of several whitish nodules, together weighing 370 grams, the largest measuring more than 10 centimeters in diameter. On cut section, the nodules showed a whitish, trabeculated, rather variegated solid tissue. The lesion offered a rather flat, solid cleavage plane at the time of surgery. Well, what we found at, at the microscopical examination was a proliferation of spindle cells with non-glandular components. These cells were irregularly arranged in random fascicles surrounded by abundant collagenous tissue. At higher magnification, we can see that the spindle cells were arranged in short intersecting fascicles with a significant interstitial collagen component. Here we see how this pattern was repeated everywhere in this lesion. In places, there was a predominance of the collagen components, as we can see on this image on the right. In these images, we can see that some of the vessels of this lesion showed some branching that we histopathologists call a uh, hemangioparasitoma-like appearance, as this is a typical feature of a hemangioparasitoma. Here we can appreciate the cytological details. Cells in general with no atypia, bland cytology, 
regular nuclei with a peculiar arrangement forming these fascicles and interstitial collagen deposition throughout the lesion. Here is the immunohistochemistry panel performed showing positive CD34 and BCL2 and proliferation index of 5%, while all the other markers such as actin, desmin, progesterone receptor, S100 and CD117 went negative. At the time of diagnosis, we did not have the STAT6 markers available, but we performed those stains later on. We can see here how the tumor cells strongly express CD34 and BCL2. Actin is negative, underlining just the vascular walls, and there is no expression of progesterone receptor. At this point, we had this case on our hands, and we were asking ourselves, what can we do with all these diagnostic elements? Here is the recently published classification of the prostatic stromal proliferations that divides them into benign and malignant lesions. I invite you to follow a publication by Hansel from 2007 classifying the stromal lesions as exclusive to the prostate gland and not exclu exclusive to the prostate. Within the group of the stromal lesions exclusive to the prostate, benign prostatic nodular hyperplasia is the most frequent. All pathologists, of course, are familiar with prostatic nodular hyperplasia originating in the transitional zone. The hyperplastic stroma has a nodular pattern, is accompanied by a glandular component and may show the presence of chronic inflammatory cells. Stromal hyperplasia, especially in prostate biopsy, can cause diagnostic difficulty in the differential diagnosis with the mysoid variants of STUMP. Multiple variants of nodular hyperplasia have been described. We see that all of them share the location in the transitional zone. Amongst them, the so-called pseudoangiometer stromal hyperplasia similar to that seen in the breast, and expressing C34 and actin. Another variant of nodular hyperplasia to be taken into account in the differential diagnosis is a sclerosing adenosis, which consists of a benign proliferation of glands with a dense fusiform stroma that of course stands out with markers of myoepithelial cells as shown in the lower figure. These lesions with the spindle cells component can give us problems in interpretation. It is an incidental finding in 2% of transurethral resections of prostatectomy specimens, while it is rarely present in needle biopsies. We now go back to the rest of the spindle cells lesions exclusive to the prostate to the group of stromal tumors of uncertain malignant potential or stumps and to the group of stromal sarcomas. These tumors derived from the specialized stroma of the prostate. Stumps and the stromal sarcomas have been named by the World Health Organization since 2004. Initially, their terminology was very controversial as was their definition. The average age of presentation is 58 and they can occur in young people too. The age range being 27 to 83 years with a peak incidence in the 6th, 7th decade. Symptoms are usually urinary obstruction, increased PSA, abnormal digital and rectal examination, mimicking urinary obstruction due to prostatic hyperplasia although it may also be accompanied by, by hematuria and hematospermia. In general, the stumps remain confined to the prostate and rarely progress to sarcoma. The prostatic stromal tumor of uncertain malignant potential has a solid macroscopic appearance or of a variably sized cyst with a mucoid content 
that can settle both in the transitional zone and the peripheral zone of the prostate gland. Histology can show many different patterns. I described five presentation patterns and its conformation can be single phase or biphasic. In other words, it may be purely stromal or it may be combined with a glandular component. The most common histological pattern is of a stromal hypercellularity with the generative aspects, which are present in 50% of these lesions. It may also present as an hypercellular and spindle cells stroma only, or as a hypocellular fibrous stroma, similar to the breast phylloids. These, there are also other patterns with a mysoid stroma or with a epithelial cellular appearance. We have to keep in mind that in all these variants, mitosis are rare and tumor necrosis do not occur. The prostatic stromal sarcomas affect a population of younger men, 50% of them being under 50 years of age. A prostatic stroma sarcoma can arise ex novo or be associated with an existing stump. Microscopically, it presents as a proliferation of prostatic stromos, stromal cells with a solid growth pattern that can have various patterns, storiform, epithelioid, or fibrosarcomatous. It is an, a hypercellular lesion with atypia with mitotic figures and the necrosis, as we see in the second photo. Two categories are established, low and high grade. Immunohistochemistry is similar of, to that of stumps, with combined expression of progesterone receptors and CD34. It should be emphasized that they can sometimes coexist, a stump lesion and a prostatic stromal sarcoma as we can see in the third figure. And of course, there can be a variability in their behavior and they, uh, that their possible coexistence poses challenges not only for their diagnosis, but also for the clinical management of patients. Let's continue now and talk about the sarcomatoid carcinoma of the prostate. The sarcomatoid carcinoma or carcinosarcoma is a very rare type of prostate cancer, showing a mixture of malignant glandular and stromal elements that are clonally related. In some cases, almost 30% may have heterologous elements of osteosarcoma, chondrosarcoma or rhabdomyosarcoma. The spindle cell component frequently expresses keratin, and this fact suggests a common origin rather than a collision tumor. There may be an history of prostate adenocarcinoma with a radiotherapy or a hormonal therapy. The sarcomatoid carcinoma has a poor evaluation with frequent metastasis in bones, liver, and lungs. We go back now to our case. We discarded the hypothesis of a stromal nodule of hyperplasia. It could be a stump. We have some points to be discussed in terms of stromal sarcomas of the prostate. Now that we have considered the exclusive lesions of the prostate, we also should take into account the group of lesions non-exclusive to the prostate gland that we can find here as well as in other organs. Such lesions include leiomyomas, leiomyosarcomas, rhabdomyosarcoma, inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor, solitary fibrous tumor, gastrointestinal stromal tumor, and others. The first lesions correspond to the group of smooth muscle tumors. They are leiomyomas and leiomyosarcomas. They are the most frequent mesenchymal tumors of the prostate and have this typical fascicular appearance with cells with acidophilic cytoplasm, hyperchromatic nuclei, and expression of specific markers of smooth muscle. 
The second entity to be considered is a rhabdomyosarcoma, which is an entity almost exclusive to the population of pediatric patients. It shows, of course, expression of specific markers of skeletal muscle, such as myosin and desmin, and is negative for other markers that rule out an epithelial origin, such as GATA3 and PSA. We must also consider the inflammatory myofibroblastic tumour characterised by a proliferation of myofibroblasts within a background of inflammatory cells and edema. This lesion expresses ALK. Other tumours to be considered are the gastrointestinal stromal tumours, either a primary lesion in rectum with prostatic involvement or a lesion of the prostate itself. In our case, we rule it out because it did not express CD117, although it shared the expression of CD34. Here, we will also consider the solitary fibrous tumour, SFT. What can we say about the solitary fibrous tumour of the prostate? It is an extremely rare mesenchymal tumour. Approximately 20 cases have been described and in the old literature it was reported as hemangiopericytoma. Was histological characteristics resembled the most common tumour variant of solitary fibrous tumour in the pleura. In 10 to 20% of cases they behave more aggressively and it must be taken into account that the fibrous tumour and the stump can have characteristics that overlap within each other. This table shows the comparative morphological characteristics of the cellular lesions of the prostate gland and highlights the stump with four or five different patterns and the solitary fibrous tumour that we have recently described with the uniformly arranged cells, with bland cytology, without a defined pattern, and collagen background, similarly to our case. In this comparative chart of the immunohistochemical profile between different lesions of the prostatic stroma, we see that the solitary fibrous tumour and stump share the expression of CD34 although STUMP expresses progesterone receptors and in our case progesterone was negative. A new monoclonal antibody STAT6 has recently emerged, which is the product of a chimeric fusion of NAB2 STAT6 and SFT specific fusion gene. This monoclonal antibody exhibits strong nuclear reactivity in solitary fibrous tumour. This image highlights the high positivity of a solitary fibrous tumour. With a positivity rate of nearly 98%, it is considered a very sensitive marker for solitary fibrous tumours. STAT6 is negative in most morphological mimics. So it is a sensitive and specific marker, even when morphological features suggestive of malignancy are present. In our case, we scored the STAT6 in a second time after the diagnosis and the initial immunohistochemical panel that has been performed. A solitary fibrous tumour, when completely resected, has a benign clinical course. An adequate surgical resection margin is essential to disease-free survival. When the clinical course is more aggressive, this is associated with increased nuclear sites, pleomorphism, necrosis, increased mitotic activity and positive surgical margins. Although currently the treatment for SFT and STUMP in the prostate is similar, the move towards more specific therapies in solid tumours will require a precise histological distinction between the two entities. A limited immunohistochemical panel including STAT6PR and CHI67 may be helpful in differentiating prostate MSFT 
prostate stromal sarcomas, and stone. As described in our case, we, we ruled out a leiomyosarcoma, we ruled out a rhabdomyosarcoma, we also ruled out an inflammatory myofibroblastic tumour, and we ruled out a gastrointestinal stromal tumour. We can confirm histologically and by auxiliary methods the diagnosis of solitary fibrous tumour of the prostate. As a conclusion, we can say that spindle cells lesions of prostate are very infrequent entities, and their rarity, together with the overlapping morphological and immunohistochemical features of these lesions, make their diagnosing challenging for a practicing pathologist, especially on a small needle biopsy samples. Pathologists have generally little experience in diagnosing such lesions and a definitive diagnosis was given in our case based on a constellation of morphological and immunohistochemical features. Differences in prognosis and treatment options highlight the importance of accurately diagnosing these lesions. Thank you very much for your attention.